Hey, this is day 328. We're reading the whole Bible this year, and today is Galatians 1 through 3. We pick up in the book of Galatians right now because this is likely the group of churches that Paul wrote to that we just read about in the book of Acts. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul's visiting churches in this region, and then he's a little further north in Acts 16. It's probably to both. Uh, It's likely that this letter was written after the council in Jerusalem based on some of the stuff he talks about in here. We know either way, he's writing to churches in Galatia and the early practice of the church was even those who received these letters quickly began making copies and passing them on to others and saw them as beneficial to all churches who are following the gospel and serving Christ. At the very beginning, we see that Paul is the writer of the letter. But this first piece says quite a lot. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me. That's his intro. This is who's writing it to all the churches in Galatia. All of them, not some of them, not most of them, not just the recent ones I visited. All. It's probably later after this journey in Acts 16. And after the Jerusalem council, he's writing to all these churches that he's been working with and reminding them and establishing in them what they've been trained up in. From the book of Acts, uh, we know that Paul was traveling with other people like here in these regions, he's traveling with Timothy and Silas and so on. And so he's writing from all of them like, hey, we all write to you. Probably they're discussing some of the things that are going on in these churches that Paul is going to be addressing in the letter. And so there was probably a bit of conversation. They probably contributed some of the ideas or, you know, worked it out as Paul's talking. And then they prayed and Paul wrote the letter and they sent it and so on. Also, his apostleship is not based on being sent by men. It's sent by God. And that becomes really important as he establishes his argument throughout this. So quickly in chapter one, after we get a little greeting, you know, grace and peace to you and so on. And and that's a pretty standard greeting in those days. Give some glory to God. It's a good way to start a letter. And so he starts with, what's wrong with you? I am surprised that you guys are so easily led astray. I just preached this to you and you're already turning away from it. If anybody, even an angel from heaven or one of us comes to you and preaches a different gospel, it's false and they should be cursed. And he says it twice. He wants to make it really clear. Like, I'm not pulling punches. I'm telling you clearly, this is not okay. And that's a really important thing for us even today to recognize, like, clarity of the gospel and manipulating or twisting the gospel to say something it doesn't say or to make it something that Christ did not establish is an accursed thing that leads to a gospel that does not save because it does not bring people into the saving grace of Christ. It it doesn't point to Christ. It doesn't give Christ the glory and the credit. It puts the credit and the glory somewhere else. And if you do that, then that gospel no longer brings salvation. In verse 11, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I didn't receive it from a man. I received it by revelation from Christ. And then he proceeds for the rest of chapter one into chapter two to defend his apostleship, his calling. He gives the stories like, this is how I met Christ. This is when he gave it to me. This is how I was raised up with Barnabas and Peter and James. And the, I met all these guys. And then he says in chapter two, and that didn't impress me. Like it's not, I'm not saying that to impress. I'm just saying I get this gospel from heaven and I go and check with them and they go, yeah, that's it. hundred percent go tell everybody. And so he's talking about his calling and how the the importance of it, it, it's not that it comes from men, it's that it comes from Jesus. And it was verified and validated. It was vetted by men who know what they're talking about and who walked with Christ. That's an important distinction. And then Paul leans in and says, I even opposed Peter. He's like, the reason it's important that the gospel didn't come from men is because men are fallible. Paul is fallible. Peter's fallible. All of them are. As he says, even Peter got a little confused, got a little off topic when men from Jerusalem came and all of a sudden Peter's like, oh, uh, let me put my tassels on. Let me not eat with the Gentiles. Like he's shunning the Gentiles all of a sudden. Paul's like, hold up, dude. You were eating with them earlier. What's wrong with you? He says he even got Barnabas confused. Like everybody's getting thrown off by trying to figure out like which parts of the law they should be living by. 
again, probably something that spoke into the need for the council at Jerusalem. And Paul says at, at the end of chapter two, he says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, talking about like the the life and the law and, and without Christ and all of that, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. If we try to add to Christ's sacrifice, we preach a different gospel. We're we're claiming some other requirements for salvation. And now we are to be condemned and we are leading people into condemnation and it's no good is only do you believe in christ and him crucified if not you are not saved period doesn't matter what good things you do you believe in christ and him crucified then as james said your life should reflect that and show that and be the proof of your faith in that and your service to him as king and lord and so chapter three then jumps back into you foolish galatians what is wrong with you and then he starts talking about the the spirit and the law and and the freedom and grace of god and talking about abraham justified by faith and that was credited as his righteousness and the key thing about that is every jew is going to like accept an appeal to abraham like yeah he's our boy And he came before the law. And so he wasn't subject to the law. So his righteousness was not because he followed the law properly. It's because he believed God. Following the law was an act of obedience to the Lord by faith. And and those who did that by faith until the time when Christ appeared and released us from what the law, where the law showed us our shortcomings. As he says at the end here, he says, But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe before this faith came in Christ. We were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And now faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the law. We are no longer under the law because Christ has come, because the law was to prepare us and point us toward what Christ was going to set us free from. And so the law is not our means of salvation. It points to the one who is our salvation. And so then the end of three, the most important thing, the the gospel summed up once again and some important key points, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So now it's Christ that is seen, not Jew or Greek, not slave or free, not male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In baptism, you are buried and raised to life. And now you are in Christ, not in Brian, white guy, dad, husband, you know, pastor, whatever things you want to say about me, like none of those qualify me as a believer. It's my faith in Christ, just as it is for my kids, for my wife. They each have to believe in Christ and they are each saved by their faith in Christ, just as it is for anybody else in our church or in any other church. You're not saved because you go to the right church or because you do the right things or because you sing the right song. You're saved by faith in Christ and in that alone. That's what he says. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. One quick thing I want to point out while we're talking about this end part here, no Jew nor Greek or slave nor free or male nor female. And I have heard it taught in our crazy society that is just making up whatever it wants about reality. And trying to use that as a justification for gender fluidity, trans, all this kind of ideologies, this gender confusion, that is not what Paul is saying. That concept would not even make sense to a first century Christian. There's no way to try and put that on them as to take their words, twist them into something that was never meant, and then try and apply it to the 21st century issues that we're dealing with now. Done rightly, if we understand what was being said, understand what was true, not just what contextual meaning, but what eternal truths are there, then we get to application in our time. If we do it the other way, we go, this is what I need in our time. 
here's a truth I want to have, and then I'm going to shoehorn it into the scripture. We're getting that backwards. We cannot twist this into being something that supports that because that's not what it's talking about. God's word is very clear, and that's not how this works. Christ is not erasing the concept of gender. Paul is pointing out that in Christ, there is no bonus qualification or extra saved because you're a man more than a woman. Women are not more or less children of God because of their gender. That is the beginning and end of what he means by that. And I think that's unfortunately an important distinction and point we have to make given the culture we live in. In all these things, I got to come back to the end of chapter two. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith and the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And that, that part speaks to the things that we do, do not earn our salvation. There's nothing I can do or have to do to earn my salvation. Instead, in line with what Paul is saying here, from that place, we recognize what got us to this place of salvation is Christ. From there, we do the works, the good works and obedience to God prove that we truly are saved. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit, we do the righteous works. Nothing we do earns our salvation. Christ is our salvation. By faith in him, we are justified. Then we do good works as a result of our salvation. And then if we can get that part straight in our heads, then James agrees with Paul. And all of this makes beautiful, beautiful sense and, and, and a call to a wonderful life of, of serving and loving and leading others to this glorious salvation that we have in Christ by faith, by the grace of God. I'd love to hear what stands out to you. So let's talk about that in the chat. I want to encourage you, keep reading. Know God better tomorrow than you do today. Dig in a little more each day. Be transformed from glory to glory and pursue the one who gave everything for you. Be rad for Jesus.